Under the Japanese occupation during much of World War II, the doctrine of Asia for the Asiatics was spread across Eastern and Southern Asia. During this period, the people of many Asiatic lands had their thirst for independence whetted. That yearning for freedom was seized upon by the opportunistic Japanese leaders in their campaign to stimulate the people to hatred of the Allies. With the end of World War II, the stirrings of nationalism flared into eruption throughout most of Southern and Eastern Asia. In the spring of 1945, American and Australian bombers opened up on Borneo, the largest island in the invaluable Dutch East Indies. Borneo, strategically located between Malaya and Australia, was an important invasion target. Allied warships performed their familiar prelude to invasion. Australian soldiers went ashore at several points on the large island and drove inland against spirited resistance. Tank infantry teams made rapid progress. On June 10th, General MacArthur landed on Labuan Island off British North Borneo and congratulated the Australians on a job well done. Japanese domination over the peoples of Asia was nearing an end. With the end of World War II, the islands of the East Indies, which had been ruled by the Dutch before the war, became the new independent nation of Indonesia in the eyes of the people of those islands. In Jogjakarta, Java, Ahmed Sukarno, the native leader during the Japanese occupation and a group of associates, proclaimed the independence of the Isles of the Indies. The nationalists consolidated their position quickly. Everyone available was enlisted to work in the common cause. The setting up of a functioning government strong enough to withstand any attacks upon it by the Allied forces scheduled soon to arrive. The nationalists were determined to stand their ground. In December 1945, the first Dutch troops arrived in the Indies, four months after Japan surrendered. The Dutch Marines were assigned to take over the job of keeping order and restoring the islands to Dutch rule, a job which had been performed by British troops until the arrival of the Dutch Queen's forces. The men went right to work in an attempt to quell the insurgents' rebellion. At Cherubon, on the island of Java, Dutch and Indonesian leaders effected a partial compromise of differences and a ceasefire in the Lingajati Agreement. But that condition did not last long. Dutch troops moved into territory acknowledged to be Republican by the terms of the agreement. The Dutch police action resulted in a renewal of violence. A settlement of differences between the Dutch and Indonesians seemed more remote than ever. Bridges were destroyed by the retreating natives. The Indonesians ravaged their own land rather than have it prove useful to the Dutch. In mid-1947, the United Nations attempted mediation. Australia's delegate, William Hodgson, called for an immediate cessation of hostilities and peaceful arbitration. But the issue was far from being settled. The communists in Indonesia, who had been supporting the nationalists in their fight for independence, rebelled. The 
Republican troops went to work quickly, rounding up every communist they could locate. The uprising was ineptly staged, and within a month it was decisively crushed by the Indonesian Republican forces. With its leaders either captured or killed, the communist force collapsed, and the threat to the success of the nationalist cause ended. In December 1949, the islands of the Indies officially became the Republic of the United States of Indonesia. Elected president by the 16 Nagaras of the Federation of Indonesian States, Sukarno was sworn in in a ceremony at Jogjakarta. The new ruler, who had collaborated with the Japanese, had been striving toward this day for some 30 years. Finally, after four years of fighting and negotiating, he and his people were officially recognized as an independent nation. In Indonesia, as elsewhere in Asia, colonialism was dying. India had been working toward an independent status for several decades. With World War II, the stirrings of nationalism throughout Southern Asia accelerated the tempo of that movement. The people of the subcontinent of India had been promised a certain degree of self-rule by the British. Finally, on August 15, 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru represented India's millions at the ceremony in which Britain's Lord Mountbatten presented India her sovereignty. The new India became an important member of the British Commonwealth of Nations. But Britain no longer ruled the vast territory which held a dominant position in Southern Asia. In Karachi, Lord Mountbatten attended another ceremony to celebrate the creation of a new independent nation. Mohammed al Jinnah and some 75 million supporters, mostly Muslim, were at last the masters of their own destiny as the sovereign nation of Pakistan. The new Muslim nation of Pakistan was carved out of parts of what had been the India of the British Empire. The balance of the Indian colonial territory became the new Hindu nation of India. But freedom for the peoples of the Indian subcontinent was accompanied by rioting and bloodshed. Hundreds of thousands died in these fierce clashes between the Muslims and Hindus over the division of the land between Pakistan and India. Some of the territory at issue became a no man's land. Millions of natives left their homes to move to an area where their religion was honored. Muslims poured into Pakistan and Hindus caught within the borders of the new Muslim nation migrated to the new India. For many, the move meant uprooting their lives but no sacrifice was too great to make for their religious freedom. India's independence was a high point in the life of Mohandas Gandhi, the spiritual leader of the nation's millions and its most powerful nationalist leader. Passive resistance was Gandhi's approach, a doctrine he practiced with great effect in furthering the cause of nationalism. But in January 48, Gandhi was assassinated by a member of an extremist faction. India had lost her steadiest guiding hand. Thousands upon thousands paid homage to India's great leader. The mourners included not only Hindus, but Muslims, Sikhs, and Britons, who sincerely believed that the world had lost a great man. In Pakistan, as in India, strong efforts were made to effect conciliation of differences between the two nations. But in Kashmir, a disputed province, the strange situation flared into open warfare. To the Western world, Kashmir had long been a fabled remote land. In 1947, Kashmir's Maharaja refused to accede to either India or Pakistan and the fight was on. Indian armed forces arrived to combat the Muslim troops from Pakistan. In the closing months of 1947, the disturbance turned into a real war.
On January 1st, 1949, through the efforts of the United Nations, a ceasefire was effected. Pakistan refused to withdraw its troops from the disputed province when India declared its intentions of keeping its soldiers in the area. Pakistan held some economic advantages over India, for in East Pakistan, the bulk of the world's jute is grown. Pakistan's supply of this precious fiber, no longer sent to India, was now shipped directly overseas. Both nations underwent rigid economic readjustment. Even India's fabulously wealthy Maharajas felt the pinch. They were stripped of much of their political power and some of their wealth. But India's former ruling classes still managed to lead a luxurious existence, far removed from the lot of the untouchables at the lowest level of Hindu life. For millions of India's people lived on only a few grains of rice. On January 26, 1950, the Republic of India was established. India had been a free nation for almost two and a half years. But this ceremony heralded the severing of the bond with the British crown. That on and from this, the 26th day of January 1950, India, that is Bharat, shall be a sovereign democratic republic. The raising of the flag of the republic's first president symbolized complete freedom to the Indian people. In Burma, which was granted its independence by Britain in 1948, a struggle for control was waged by about a dozen political factions of varying shades, including two communist groups. In nearby Malaya, Britain continued to rule. But its colonial administration was constantly challenged by communist guerrillas operating from the hills. British and colonial troops were pressed into service to protect Malaya's rubber plantations and tin mines from the raids of the guerrillas. But the soldiers had difficulty in coming to grips with an enemy which disappeared into thin air, or so it seemed to the colonial troops. In the years following the defeat of Japan, Britain's control of the Malay Peninsula was far from strong. The Philippine Islands had been promised their independence by 1946. But with the Japanese invasion and conquest of the islands, the people's hopes dimmed. But in spite of that strong setback, the Philippines celebrated their independence just as planned on July 4th, 1946. With this ceremony, a new nation is born. A nation conceived in the centuries-old struggle of a people to attain the political liberty to embark upon its own national destiny. A nation upon whom the eyes of all oppressed peoples are today cast with the burning light of a new faith. The formal declaration of Philippine independence was made by U.S. Commissioner Paul McNutt. I am authorized and directed by the President of the United States to proclaim the independence of the Philippines as a separate and self-governing nation. The infant republic experienced the customary growing pains during those first heady months of freedom. Philippine political life still reflected the upheaval caused by the war and the Japanese occupation. In fact, one of the election issues, in addition to government corruption and the control of communism, was the degree of collaboration with the Japanese indulged in by one or another of the candidates. The Philippine political picture remained muddled for many months. The first president of the Republic was Manuel Rojas, who had worked with the Japanese, but was cleared by General MacArthur. The Huck Balahaps constituted the government's biggest headache. 
Once strongly anti-Japanese, the Hucks now trained their sights on the new government and its policies. With the end of World War II, French Indochina seemed destined for a revival of French colonial administration. In the French Empire, no colony was more desirable than Indochina. General Jacques Leclerc, the liberator of Paris, arrived in Indochina in late 1945 to conduct mopping up operations against the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese were ardent nationalists who lived in an area comprising almost half of French Indochina. The bitter clashes with the French troops marked the start of a full-scale war which continued for some 17 months. The French proclaimed their control and backed up their statements by force of arms. French soldiers were fighting in dead earnest. For Frenchmen, no part of the war-ravaged colony was entirely safe. The military operations the French were conducting against the Vietnamese were in no way dissipating the natives' desperate urge for freedom from French colonial rule as they had known it before the Japanese occupation. Most of the fighting was in Vietnam, which includes three of the five countries comprising pre-war French Indochina. Finally, on June 14, 1949, the independent state of Vietnam under Bao Dai, former emperor of Annam, was recognized by the French as independent, but existing within the French Union. But to the natives of Vietnam, even this limited form of independence under a leader who did as directed by the French was some improvement over pre-war French colonial rule. The age-old countries of Cochin China, Annam, and Tonkin, united as the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, embarked on a new era in the history of Southeast Asia, a period which bore only surface resemblances to the era which ended in Asia with World War II. This new day was inaugurated in Vietnam as elsewhere throughout Asia with warfare. The most urgent task facing the French and Vietnamese was the job of containing the advances of communist Viet Minh forces, which were operating in strong guerrilla groups throughout Vietnam. To the north, Asia's most troubled country, China, moved right from one war, that with Japan, to another, the war with the communist forces, without a pause. Chiang Kai-shek had led China through a series of great crises, but with the end of war with Japan, Jiang and China embarked on an even more critical period. The new antagonist, Chinese communist Mao Zedong, gained adherence quickly. Jiang's forces fought a long, exhausting series of campaigns in a vain attempt to stop the communist advance from spreading across China. Over a period of two years after the end of World War II, China received hundreds of millions of dollars worth of material aid from UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. The major part of that assistance, about two-thirds of the total amount, was furnished by the U.S. In late 1945, General George Marshall arrived in China to try to effect a ceasefire between the two Chinese forces. At first, his mission seemed headed for success. During January 1946, a series of conferences involving both nationalists and communists achieved some positive results. On January 10th, a ceasefire agreement was reached, endorsed by the nationalists and communists in the mediator's presence. But the Marshall mission and a subsequent survey of the problem conducted by General Albert Wedemeyer both proved inconclusive. 
Meanwhile, Mao's forces grew stronger while the debate raged on what U.S.-China policy should be. By early 1949, Mao commanded a formidable fighting force. In late May of that year, Shanghai fell to the advancing Chinese Communist armies. The Communist soldiers moved quickly into the heart of the city, which had been evacuated by the Nationalists after they had boasted that they would defend it with the last drop of their blood. The Chinese civilians in Shanghai were quick to applaud their new masters. Overnight, Shanghai's population became ardently communistic. In Beiping, in October 1949, Russia's ambassador, Roshin, presented his credentials to Mao Zedong, and the bond between the Chinese communists and the Soviet Union was cemented. Mao Zedong, once a lowly party worker, now assumed the stature of the dominant figure in all of Eastern Asia. The nationalist troops, those that hadn't joined forces with the communists, fled southward with their families. Many surrendered their weapons to the French in Indochina. The nationalist defense of China had turned into a rout. From a small area in North China, Mao's forces swept over all of mainland China. Formosa provided a haven for Chang and the remnants of his army. Beginning in December 1949, on his island sanctuary, Zhang worked toward the day when China could be freed from the communist yoke. He had the support of the United States. But Britain, by recognizing Red China, weakened the cause of Generalissimo and Madame Chang. Britain has bartered the soul of a nation for a few pieces of silver. I say, for shame to Britain. One day, these pieces of silver will bear interest in British blood sweat and tears on the battleground of freedom. For that which is morally wrong can never be politically right. In addition to U.S. military aid for his troops, Zhang was further aided by the presence in waters off Formosa of the U.S. 7th Fleet, which was assigned by the U.S. to save the island from the communists. In Korea, which had been ruled by the Chinese and the Japanese during the past century, the end of World War II introduced two allied powers, Russia and the United States, which occupied the northern and southern sections of the country. It is my sincere belief that our great victories on the battlefields of the world will be followed by complete cooperation and collaboration around the council tables of the great nations, resulting in continuance of world peace, and that our conferences here will solve the pressing problem of the Korean people. I greet the Korean people who are liberated from the long oppression of the Japanese imperialists by the glorious troops of the Red Army and the Army of our allies, the United States of America. General Hurt. I would like to express assurance that our negotiations with your representative will bring the solution of urgent problems having vital importance for the whole of Korea. In North Korea, the Soviet interpretation of administration and occupation consisted of impressing communism on the country. Soon after the Russians arrived, a communist government was functioning in North Korea under such native leaders as communist Kim Il-sung, a Russian puppet. At the end of World War II, Korea had been divided arbitrarily at the 38th parallel. South of that degree of latitude, the U.S. was the occupying power. On August 15, 1948, the U.S. made South Korea an independent republic. Most South Koreans were determined to protect that newly won freedom. In August 1948, that job did not seem too difficult. But during the first years of the infant republic's existence, the job of protecting that independence assumed larger proportions. 
Communist demonstrations inspired by natives in the northern half of Korea gave the first inkling of further trouble ahead. The 38th parallel of latitude was to prove a most ineffectual barrier against the sweep of communist aggression from the north. Oh! 